Right, we're on. <clears throat> Welcome, folks. Welcome back to the Bailey Workshop for guitar making on the Guitar Making Channel. Yes, today we're going to be talking about carving. In fact, I'm going to actually carve this guitar for you. Carol's already lost concentration. This guitar for you. Sorry. <laughs> Um, this is Roland's guitar, so I'm going to be carving this um, very similar to like what you'd see a PRS or something like that. Not exactly, but something similar to that. Um, so I've had requests for this, so that's why I'm doing it. Um, to be honest with you, I thought I'd be running out of ideas by now, but we've got so much to get through. Um, I haven't even... We're making a tiny dent in the amount of stuff I've got to get through. So this is part six, I think, of guitar making techniques, carving. Part six. So welcome if you've been here before. And if you're new here, then double welcome. And uh, if you find something in this video that you like, make sure you do all the YouTube stuff. Like it and subscribe and all that stuff. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be carving this top live. I'm going to be getting all hot and sweaty and it is quite hard work. So I'm not entirely sure how far I'm going to get. 
and bear in mind this is live so I'll just point that out again anything could happen so yeah we're up to part six of guitar making techniques and uh, I've got another couple of things to show you so by the end of this series I'll have shown you everything that you need to know to build a basic guitar something like this um, but this is kind of like a little bonus really um, most of the carving that you'll actually have to do is obviously on carving the neck now I already did a live stream where I built a guitar completely from scratch um, so if you want to see me actually carve a neck then um, I think that would that would be part three of the the live guitar build um, part three where the magic happens carving the neck um, so I'm not going to be doing that today I'm going to be focusing on carving this body um, but I will show you the what I think are the essential tools for carving to make the basic guitar something like this okay so I have a, a book it's like a mini ebook called uh, essential tools for guitar making and obviously because you need to carve your neck you need some kind of carving tools what I recommend is something like this now we sell these rasps on the site so if you want you can get yours from us Bill got you, here you, today. yeah B yes. Bill's arrived today well done Bill thanks for that um, there's more on the way I know um, so this is the one I recommend and you will also need a, a round one so this is what I call a rasp if we go to the camera two Carol this is a rasp if you look at the teeth the teeth all point forward and so it has to it has to move in this direction to cut so these are the rasps just like the ones we're selling and I recommend you'll need some kind of half inch round one for getting into the tight corners and believe it or not those are the only essential carving tools that you'll need to make a guitar now having said that to do a full-on carve on the body you'll need an extra tool and that would be the gouge so today you'll see me using a gouge um, handy because it cuts a curve so these are the three tools that you'll mainly see me using today but there are a whole range of other tools and I'm just going to very quickly go through those now so as I showed you this is what we call a rasp with teeth on it this one and this is what we call a surf form it's just got smaller teeth and then we have our bladed tools like chisels and also we have um, we have our curved chisel which you can buy from our shop these are great for carving um, the braces on acoustic guitars so that's a kind of bracing and I think the ultimate tool is a curved chisel for that one so we call this the guitar makers chisel and these are available on our site as well I'm not going to get into that today though because that's for acoustic guitars here's a few extra bladed tools this is probably the cutest thing I've got in the workshop look at that it's tiny but believe it or not it does actually get used it's a curved bottom plane non-essential but great fun and this I've got three different sizes of that these are curved planes which are handy for carving I might even just demonstrate using them on this but you don't need them to do this um, they are handy they are made to do this kind of job but you don't need it um, they are beautiful yes um, I got these specifically for carving um, jazz arch top guitars believe it or not just the tool for the job Hold that little one up again. some of those tiny some of those tight curves that is just the tool for the job there you go. <laughs> made by ibex as you can see there hopefully gorgeous but non-essential so let's put them to one side so more bladed tools we've got planes so planes believe it or not can be used for carving and you will see me using that today um, there's certain areas on the guitar which are really handy to use a plane for and the last bladed tool well not the last spoke shaves 
Everybody expects me to be using spoke shaves to carve necks. But as I said in the video, when I did carve the neck, I don't like them. Um, it's not entirely true. I, I do like them. I do use them occasionally, but really only when I'm showing off. Only when I'm trying to show off, get the spoke shave out. <laughs> we get the posh visitors around, I'll get the spoke shave out. But um, f so they are, they do have their purpose and their place and they are fine tools. Um, by the way, that one belongs to you, Patrick, <laughs> if you're watching. Patrick Ego, this one's yours. I guess I should send it back to you. Um, it was my going away present from the factory. <laughs> Patrick left before me and he left it behind. So it was just sitting there on the shelf. And I thought, oh, I might, I might need that one day. I'll take that. So anyway, Patrick, I've never used it. <laughs> so if you want it back, let me know and I'll, I'll just send it back to you. And, and I could swear to my life I only had one of these. But I looked in my drawer today to show you, and there's two of them. <laughs> so they obviously multiply. They're like moles, these things. Don't stop me. These things are like moles. <laughs> you cannot get rid of them. So, Patrick, I'm going to just send it back to you, <laughs> whether you want it or not. Right, so I'll just show you the, the proper technique. If you, Carol, put it back to camera one yeah, for a minute. Um, yeah, I need to see my face then. You're not on camera one. You're on camera oh, two. Oh, I see. Camera one's... Yeah, I've got you. Right, let's I'm going to show you the proper way to use a spoke oh, shave, right? Okay. What you do is you hold it carefully like that. You walk over to your bin. And you just... Carol, zoom in, please. Zoom in? Well, they need to see what I'm doing. It's very important. Right, hold, on. hold it over the bin and then just... Let go. <laughs> That's my guitar making joke. That's it, I've done it now. The entire series is done. Yeah. I've done my joke. Thank God you're not... Luckily I missed the bin and I'll pick it up because I'm not really going to throw it away. My point is though that I do not recommend this for a beginner. Um, I recommend what I say in my essential tools which is a rasp and a half round rasp. You could probably get away without that one and just use that one, to be honest. But like I say, there are a lot of other tools. Surf forms. So like I say, this is a surf form. And um, there are other types of surf form. So the, these ones, are, these, are, um, these are also recommended. Um, just because they're so easily to, easy to get easy available you can probably nip to your local hardware shop and get one of these and also the handle turns so you can have it set up like that if you prefer see that oh yeah that's it with the yellow one so you just you just undo that screw on the on the handle there and then you can turn the handle 90 degrees so they're handy there's another surf one they come in all shapes and sizes never used that one um that's a rasp that I that I saw on special offer in home base and they had a whole bin full for a fiver and I wish I'd bought all of them because <laughs> it's brilliant but it's a, a smaller version of the rasp handy um what else we got you this have enough tools then this is another kind of rasp um these are ones where it's got like these little let's go to the ultra close up cam go this one is this one working it's got these little yeah. teeth which are kind of punched. Oh, yeah. um, some people like these. Personally, I don't like them. I prefer my style of rasp, which is these with these teeth. I find these are a lot more fierce. You can remove a lot more wood a lot faster with one of these. Rah! Um, this is a, a wood file, so it's getting extremely fine. So just for doing a bit of fine work, taking out your rasp marks, you can use that. And <clears throat> you might, I might have shown you guys this before. This is my guitar maker's knife. Yeah, with a chunk out of it. There's a story behind that. Um, I've redesigned this knife now. I thought the big wooden handle would be a good idea. But actually... Um, I'm making these for sale now, actually. These are going to be for sale very soon in the shop. Not yet. We're still working on it. But here's the new design. 
with a slimmed down handle. Um, yeah, so the problem, as you can see, this one's got a big niche out of it. That was because to sharpen it, you have to put it down on a, on a sharpening stone and, and the, the wooden handle got in the way. So a lot thinner handle actually works better in this case. And it allows you to get um, right in there and sharpen that blade. So this is our new guitar maker's knife. Um, keep an eye out for this. In the next week or two, this is going to be available for sale. Um, I'll probably do a video on it or something. I am going to show you how we make them as well. I'll do the same with the, with the guitar maker's chisel. So yeah, beautiful, hey? Nice little guitar maker's knife. This is great for certain areas on carving the neck. And this used to be my the main tool that I used. Um, if I had one tool that I wouldn't be parted with, it would probably be my guitar maker's knife. Anyway, coming to a guitar maker's site near you. Um, I think I've gone through all the tools. Oh, just the scrapers. So it's kind of an intermediary, really. There is going to be an upcoming um, live stream on sanding, <laughs> which sounds really boring, doesn't it? But um, scraping and sanding is kind of like taking it to the next stage, you know? After you've carved it, then you need to sand it. And it's kind of an intermediary stage with scraping. So I may well pick a scraper up today and do a bit of that. But for the most part, I'll be concentrating on carving. So having said that, we need to get on with it because it's going to take some time. The first thing I need to do is mark out the body. So um, in, in a second, I'm just going to mark out this body and then I'm going to start carving it straight away. Um, but um, if you've got any questions or anything, leave them in the comments. And Carol, she'll, she's going to shout them out as we go because it is quite a long procedure. There's probably going to be... Um, what I would call long boring gaps. So if we can fill them with answering some of your questions, then that's brilliant. So let's um, start off with a couple before well, we start. Few, let's just get a few things out of the way. Go so, on then. Um, so uh, uh, James Bissett says that he's he bought a Bailey Rust last night and there's no going Yay! back now. There's, there's no, no going, going back, back now. Um, uh, somebody, I can't remember who it was. Cheers, uh, James. Somebody suggested that maybe that mark on your um, your knife was uh, were you using it as a push stick it looked quite oh that one <laughs> my old guitar maker's knife yeah and um oh it was bag press that said that treasure and, um Theron thomas who's watching he's watching from uh at cleveland's he's, he's he went you've got a bit too much caffeine because i've been chucking stuff about <laughs> yeah i come up with a new name for a collective um group of tools it's called a mess of tools isn't it obviously <laughs> A mess of tools. So that's what I had on the bench this morning. A mess of tools. Um, so we can do questions as we go. Well, there's but one, just one last one. I'm itching to get going. I know, but J Jim. So Jim McMillan says, what about a Japanese rasp? Yes, Japanese rasps. Um, all cross good cross, stuff. Uh, that, cross blade. Cross cross blade. Yeah, I guess you get what you pay for. Um, they tend to be expensive. The good ones tend to be very expensive. And I've never tried one that beat my rasps, so um, feel free to send me your rasps, um, rasp companies, and I will compare them to my rasps. <laughs> uh, Roland's in the house. Right, focus, Roland. Carol. Come on. Roland's in the house. Hi, Roland. Come on, focus, Where, Carol. Camera this want? camera, I want you to follow me on this camera. Well, I was there already. No, you can't see what I'm doing. Right. So, I'm going to mark about the depth, depth of my top. Now, if, if this was a, um, a guitar with a cap on it, then the cap would probably be about 18 mil thick. I'm going to mark where I think the cap would be. So, that would be the glue line. We've got the back of the body and the cap here. And so, we would leave a bit of the cap, maybe a quarter of an inch, six mil, and that would be where we carve to, okay? So what well, that looks like about three eighths of an inch or nine mil, nine or 10 mil. I'm gonna mark that line all the way around the body from tip to tip. Carol's gonna to attempt to follow me. I'll try and go slowly. 
I'm using one of these white pencils so you guys can hopefully see it. So, this is going to end up as a nice round top. But as we know, as we all know, whenever you're carving round shapes, you always start with facets. So what I'm doing is I'm marking on the first facet. So here at this tip, it goes from the tip down and in the center of this horn here is full depth. So it carries on to full depth and then curves up just like that. Same on the other side. And we can decide to go as deep or as shallow as we want on this. But that'll do me. Let me see that. Yeah, great. So we shape there. It's gonna come in a bit. I can just do that. Right, so now I'm gonna mark round on the front, Carol. So this horn here, I'm gonna mark the centre of the horn there. And then I join that up with this. Perfect. I'll do the same on this side. Again, you can make this curve out bigger if you want, but you do have to be careful here because you're going to have a humbucker surround. Humbucker surround here. And you don't want to be carving into that. You might want to actually get your pickup out, fit it in and make sure you're not carving into your pickup. Okay, so the rest of it, down on the bench, Carol. I'm going to start marking round the top of the facet. So some people say, why don't we just use a router, shaped router, and just run a router round? Well, the reason is it's because the profile changes as you go round. So here it's the same width there. I'm trying to go down the center of this horn and then to the waist. Let's do the same on this side, to the waist. Right, and now what happens is this Facet that I've drawn on here, it gets wider around the back. You can make it the same width if you want, but it looks nicer if it goes wider around the back. So let's just draw that on. One overhead now. Beautiful. So I'm trying to make it even, roughly, on both sides. Using my guitar maker's eye. And so now I've drawn on two lines. Hopefully we can see that quite clearly. Yes, it's, look at it, it's beautiful. I might cry. <laughs> right, so when we're carving, I've got three positions. Position number one like this, overhead cam, brilliant for this. Brilliant, okay. Overhead cam, position one. And then I can carve this part of the guitar. Position two is there, and I can carve all around the back. And then position three is there. Okay, so there's three positions um, that I have to go through and there's two stages. So um, stage one, I have to go all the way around and then that is stage one carve. Now you could call it finished at that stage um, or you can carry on and do the full carve. So time permitting, let's see how we get on. Hopefully I'm going to get that all done. So stage one carve, clamp to the bench in Position one. Why well, have a swig of tea? That's stage three. Trusty rasp. Trusty rasp. And I'm joining up these two lines, maybe close up cam for this. I'm joining up these two lines, this camera Carol. Yeah. Camera four? Yeah. Okay. 
I'm joining up this line and this line. Does that look better? Yeah, good. Okay. Right, now, if you remember this, you, you may have or may not have seen me doing some carving before. Um, unless you're from Dow Mellington and you've got eyes on, both eyes on one side of your head, you can't watch both lines at the same time. <laughs> Someone told me that people from Dow Mellington have got both there. eyes on one side of their but you've been face. There when it's not true. <laughs> anyway, the point is you can't watch both lines at the same time. So we don't, we only watch one. <laughs> right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna tip the, the rasp so that I can quickly go down to one line, right? And then I'm gonna tip it back so that I can quickly get down to the other. And then I'm just left with a lump in the middle that I can easily knock off, okay? Watch this. I've gotta be really careful here because if I slip and catch that bit, and I've ruined my neck joint. I don't want to do that. Are you watching, Roland? <laughs> Quickly down to one line. And then down to the other. Now I'm left with just a kind of lump and I'm going to try and get that as flat as possible. So um, whenever we're carving anything round, we always try and get it as flat as possible first. And then when you blend it in, it comes out nice and even with no lumps and bumps. Oh, Look at that. How does it feel to carve? Oh, it's lovely. It? It's like chocolate. Absolutely beautiful. So there you go. There's the, the first bit done. Um, you might find as well, you go in different directions, you'll get a different um, finish appearance. It will be a lot rougher carving in some directions. <laughs> Smoother in others. Right. Is it super hard? Roland's worried it's fairly it's hard. Is it going to ruin your tools? Is it? Oh, no, no, no. Walnut isn't particularly hard. It's probably softer than maple, I would say. Um, so this is an internal curve, you can see. Now this is an external curve. I'm going to use my plane for this, believe it or not. It's going to be a kind of dome shape. Uh, just plain. The plane is absolutely rubbish for internal curves, as you can see, it won't go there but it's brilliant for these external curves. And the advantage of a plane, while under rasp, is that you can't breathe in the dust. You do feel like a craftsman when you're using a plane, so let's indulge ourselves. But the same thing, I'm just trying to join up those lines. I'll roll it round. And Pretty soon, I'm back to doing this internal curve here. So I'm going back to my rasp. Now, can you see, let me just move that round. Can we go to a different camera, Carl, while I'm moving the camera? Right. You can see how it's ripped up there. That's what I was saying a minute ago. So it depends on, on which way you go with it. If I go, um, if I go this way, I'm in danger of breakout. Let me get right up close to it. Breakout, see that? I bet if I change direction and go this way, it will cut a lot smoother. There, can you see that? A lot smoother. So, hopefully you can see my lines there. Um, again, I'm gonna go down to one line first.
and then the other line. Sometimes I'll need to put my, if you get a wider shot, Carol, camera two, sometimes you need to put your hand on top of the rasp like that, because the angle's so low, I can't hold it. My hand would catch on the guitar body. So I've got my hand on top of the rasp like this. So the more accurate I do it now, the easier it will be for the next bit. Uh, where must I put this? Tripod chair, what about that? For coming around there. Again, it's ripping, so I'm going to go the other way. It's moving, so I'll tighten the clamp up. So again, I'm on an internal curve here. Um, pretty soon I'm going to come to this other curve and use a different technique. <laughs> There's a whole genre of channels where they just do stuff like this and they never talk. Questions in the comments, folks? They're all just enjoying the view. Bit more. Lovely. Look, it already starts to look round. I'm not even aiming for round yet. I'm trying to get that as flat as possible. But if I take a step back, it already starts to look like a bit, a bit like a car top. <laughs> See what I mean? Wow. Gorgeous. So position, position number two, guys. We want to make sure we're not clamping it down on any of those wood chips because they'll damage the back obviously. So now let's clamp that down there. Position number two. And this is my favourite bit because you get to use the, the plane again. So external corners. External curves um, are easier with a plane. But it's the same. Yeah, if you use camera, the close-up camera, you, you won't get a wobble. Well, there's nothing I can do, is there? Hopefully you can see what I'm doing is I'm increasing the angle again, I'm cheating to try and get down to the line quickly. I'm trying to get down to the line as quick as I can. Whoops. So I've got down to the line, now I need to get down to the line on this side. Same again. Wow, 
that's gorgeous. Well, sometimes I feel so lucky with my job. I get to see this for the first time. Ask Roland. So Roland, do you want to fill us in on this piece of wood? We know it came from Glastonbury. So Roland's in the comments and he's gonna, hopefully he's gonna, is he there? He was there, he'll be there in a bit. Ah, oh, it's got some figure in it, look. Couldn't see that before, look at this figure. Now that's one of the things about a plane. <gasps> oh yeah. That's one of the things about the plane rather than rasping or sanding is it's that you, you almost get an instant polished finish. So you can kind of see. I can't appreciate it. Oh my goodness, it's beautiful. Yeah, you can just see a bit of flame in there, look. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. There you go, bonus. Didn't expect that, did we? Okay, now I'm just going to move myself around, I'm going to start coming down this way. You still got me on uh, oh, that one. So I've got my body clamped down to some grip out there, but I have to keep stopping and tightening them up. I guess we could use stronger clamps, but we don't want to damage the wood, so. My answer to that would be, there's no such thing as right. So you can get it right first time. You just say, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Um, no, I'm not, I'm not trying to be facetious there. I do actually mean there are no laws about this kind of thing. Um, it's maybe not as difficult as you think. Um, it's a great question, actually. That is what this channel is all about, is I'm here to show you that um, I think anybody could do this. You're just joining up two lines so far. I reckon you could do that, couldn't you? I'm going to go back to my rasp and go for the final position three. Do the camera carol, please. Okay, um, Carl, Carly's asked, um, what size block did you start with? What size block? Yeah. Uh, well, in this particular case, we started with a humongous piece of wood. Um, but most guitars, you just need a piece that's about two inches thick, a 50 mil thick, um, 19 inches long. <sighs> All right, US, you can do inches, but for those Europeans out there, you need a piece about 480 mil by about um, 13 inches wide or 330 mil. Um, that's, your, that's about my average size body blank. They come a little bit bigger than that. This piece of wood actually um, was a lot, lot bigger than that. 
and I had to very carefully, as, um, as Roland will remember, we had to very carefully chop it out from this enormous piece. Look, there's the offcut. Um, it's 400 year old English walnut. And here's another piece of the offcut. Yeah. 400 year old English walnut. Yeah. So there, that's the size of the piece we started with. But um, on close examination, a lot of splits um, and all kinds of trouble. So um, we managed to get the, the, the right bit. I actually made a little video about that and sent it to Roland just to prove that we've got the best possible bit of wood there um, out of the lump. It's not always easy because you can't see what's inside it. Hi Matilda, thanks for watching. Hope you're enjoying it as much as me. <laughs> yes, so this is one of those jobs where it's going to bring out a sweat. Especially doing it live on the internet. Mike Johnson says... Hi Mike. Yeah. Make a cat from. What do you think of ash? Is it easy to carve? Is ash easy to carve? It's no, ash is one of the hardest to carve because you've got hard bits next to soft bits constantly through the grain. Um, so. Um, you'll end up, it'll end up quite lumpy. The only way to get rid of the lumps is to use a hard sanding block with 60 grit on it, really rough sandpaper. And that'll get rid of your lumps and bumps. It will look beautiful, but it won't be easy. That's the thing though, <laughs> with all highly figured wood is like that. So um, the more highly figured it is, the harder it probably is to carve. I can feel already this bit's harder because there's some more figure in this bit, more um, more grain direction changes and that kind of thing makes it more difficult to carve. So brilliant questions, folks. Keep them coming. I'm going to do a bit more sweating. I'm going to just tell you quick, Mr. Natal, who says I'm Mr. Pooh Bear Pancake. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. He'll be back. So you'll notice when I'm carving, it's like a push and slide technique. If I just push, I get this kind of rough, rough appearance. Probably can't see that. Wow, this is hard, this bit, Roland. Can you get in close with the camera forward? Yeah. It comes out kind of rough if I do that. I've not got the close-up lens on. Um, if I just slide, it does nothing at all. So you have to push and slide at the same time. You notice I'm trying to use as much of the rasp as possible to get this material away as fast as I can. So this is the third and final stage of stage one. And then we're gonna move on to stage two shortly. Yeah, one of them. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The other one I've got on my grip mat there. So you can put these planes down on this matting, that's okay. But you don't want to put them down anywhere else unless you put them down sideways. Good point, Ian. Well spotted. Wow, now I'm sweating. Well, this bit's going to be fun on the next bit. Yeah, I'll just point out at this stage while I'm dripping is that you can, there are powered tools to do this, but they're expensive 
and a lot more dangerous. And so I wanted to focus on just pure hand techniques. <laughs> just to show you that it's actually not as hard as people think, um, but it is hard work. Nothing worthwhile is ever easy, a wise man said to me once. Hey Bojack. Says, how's your horsey self? He says, I don't think Could you tell me how many hours it, this will be, this puddle will be before it's finishing? How many hours before it's finishing? Before you finish. Whoa, now that's a subject for another video. <laughs> I wish I, you never answered that question. Yeah. We could make a whole video on that subject alone. Um, one of my guitar making heroes is uh, Andy Manson. If you don't know who Andy Manson is, you should check him out. <laughs> well, Andy Manson once made a video saying, um, how long does it take to make a guitar? <laughs> and I was, I was really chuffed to see that even he doesn't know how long it takes to make a guitar. <laughs> because they're all different and every piece of wood is different and responds differently to working. So you can have an estimate, you can say it's going to be about X amount of time, but it might be double that. <laughs> so as a guitar maker, you have to make your best guess. And then if it takes twice as long, you know, you just have to suck it up. I can't say to the guy, sorry, I got it wrong. It's twice as expensive as I thought it was going to be. Um, we give a price at the start and, uh, you know, apart from changes of spec or whatever, then that's the price it will be at the end. Um, we've usually got a deadline, which I usually hit. Sorry, Eddie. sorry, Ed. <laughs> Ed is um, still waiting for his, but I am working on it. Um, I'll maybe do a little update on Wednesday for you on that. Um, but yeah, we do try really hard to hit our updates, our um, deadlines, but things have been wacky recently. Um, everything's gone crazy, so it's not been easy. Um, Question. But the, the amount of time that's left in this one, let me just think for a minute. So I haven't started making the neck yet. The neck takes three days for a basic one, um, plus any kind of fancy inlays. So I don't think there's going to be any anything spectacular, is it, on the inlays? Down to you, Roland. Um, so probably about four or five days work left in it, um, but that doesn't include finishing. So finishing, again, you can double the time. That's total time. You, you spread it out. Like um, total time. So far, there's a, a couple of days work in the body. So total time is about eight, nine days work for a guitar like this, I would say. Um, keep the questions coming. I'll keep carving. <laughs> yeah. Would you carve it before or after gluing it onto the body? Yeah, I would do it exactly like I'm doing it now. So it would already be glued to the body. All the machining would already be done. It'd be, guitar would be cut out, caps on. Um, obviously the first thing to do is glue the cap on and then we cut everything out. Unless we're doing a hollow body, then we might wait for a while before we glue the cap on. <laughs> Most guitars though, the cap would be glued on um, all the machining done, and then body shaping. Matthias J says, where, where do you get the huge mahogany? Where do we get the... Huge mahogany, but I guess he means the body... Where do you get body blanks from? Well, they're available from us. You can go on the, on the website, guitarmaking.co.uk. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's the thing with ours. You'll find cheaper wood elsewhere, but you might well have a complete nightmare just getting it roughly to thickness. Um, believe it or not, getting a piece of wood flat and straight is half the battle, that's what I always say. Um, so 
all our wood is supplied pre-thickness. If you've got a particular thickness you want, you can just ask and I'll do it for you. But yeah, aside from us, just search the internet for guitar body blank. Especially if you're not in the UK. And you'll find all sorts of stuff. <laughs> Having said that, I would recommend the stuff that we've got on our site is my recommendations, especially geared towards beginners. Um, so I've, I'm trying to make it as easy as possible for you to finish your first guitar. Once you've finished your first guitar and you've got all these methods down, then you can start going wild with it and do whatever you want. Fantastic. Great questions, guys. Thank you for that. I'm listening. Yeah, whenever you're using any kind of power tool that spins fast, there's a chance of you burning the wood. Usually it's just a surface burn, it's not a problem. So hello from Germany. But if you persist with it and you start burning, if you see smoke, time to stop. <laughs> but yeah, any kind of um, powered tool can get hot and it can cause you trouble. So I'm just going to carve this um, this horn with the plane because it's an external curve here. The plane just nicer to use for some reason. Couldn't even tell you why. Probably because it's heavier and it's got a bit of momentum with it, so it helps you. Kind of dome shape on this end, getting a bit of breakout, so I'll stop there. Finish that with the rasp. Another great question. Um, is, there any wood you would not use for top is there any wood I would not use for a carved top? Um, <laughs> not really, but what I would say that some are definitely a lot harder than others. I would say the um, one. <laughs> Ones to avoid would be highly spalted pieces. Um, you know, that spalted type of wood where it's like quite crumbly in places. Um, here's a bit of spalt. This one's okay, it's not too bad. But some of it's really far gone. It's like a fungus, it turns it to like sponge sometimes. and. Uh, Imagine trying to carve sponge, so that would be a problem there. Um, you use super sharp tools for um, carving a, a, say a, what's it called? Spalted. If it's severely spalted, you might have trouble with it. Apart from that, I don't need anything. And you've got to wear more safety, you've got to wear a mask all the time and all that. It's yeah, obviously with spalted, yes, because it is a fungus um, that can get into your lungs, which is not good. And Bad Press says he wouldn't fancy carving whalers, we've done that, haven't we? Yep. Obviously the harder it is and the more highly figured it is, um, it's going to take you longer. Rock and Roller asked, is there going to be a back carve? And Roland says belly and a leg carve. Yes, there will be calves on the back. Um, he says he needs a bigger belly carve now after this round. Yeah, well, we're doing an extra large belly calf. 
So on the back, I'll, I'll just mark it out if we get a camera two, Carol, would be probably be better. I'll move that. So um, carving that can go on the back. A belly carve. I've done this so many times that I just, what I do is I follow this hook corn here. I follow this horn round and then bring it in. And then when it finally reaches here, it's at 90 degrees to the, to the surface roughly. Now this actual shape, it will define itself depending on um, how deep you go with it. And depending on the shape of the guitar, it finds its own shape really. Your job is to keep it flat in between the lines. So if I just mark on, I wouldn't go more than halfway through here. Down a bit. I wouldn't go more than halfway through there, but something like that. And it comes up. So it cuts in. There's hardly anything to come off there and there, and a great lot amount to come off the middle, in the middle. So I always start in the middle. Um, but that's basic carving. That's all covered on the course. So... Um, you know, if you want to see me do that, I've already done that. Go to the guitar making channel. You'll need to what sign do you mean up. By course, because people have been talking about workshop courses on. Yeah, so. What are you doing? Well, how did that happen? I'm back. Yeah, don't know what happened then. We had a breakdown. Um, so yeah, I cover basic carving on the course. People are asking about the course. So if you go to the guitar making channel, you'll see um, I've made um, several online courses where you can design and build your own guitar completely from scratch. You start with a blank piece of paper and you go through the whole design procedure step by step designing your own dream guitar or just a basic one, whatever. I would always recommend you start with something basic, but you don't have to. Um, you can do whatever you want. It's your guitar. Um, but I, I've been working on this, what, five years? So it's not something we've just thrown together um, because of COVID. It's not just been thrown together because of that. We've been working on this for the last five years or something. It took me three years to put it together to the point where we had the complete design and build courses for acoustics and electric guitars. But it's all there. It's all there, We're just waiting for you. No waffles. Step by step guides. Yeah, with all the waffle cut out of it. So pure action and information. Um, and no messing about like what you get on these live streams. Couple of, couple of questions. Let me draw on another calf here, if you can get. So this is what, this rests on your knee. It's another little extra calf. That you can hold rest on, on your knee on, there. So, just a little carve there makes it feel comfortable on your knee. A little scoop out there. Okay, so I'm not going to carve the back today because those are easy. Um, I'm concentrating on the front. So. That, folks, is stage one. Check it out. It already looks like a carv top, doesn't it? That is what I would call a stage one carv. That could be sanded up. And you see these are flat facets. That's a flat facet. So if I sanded that with a flat block, then what we would end up with is um, a line all the way around there. Kind of like what you get on an SG. If you picture an SG, you've got this nice facet all the way around. Um, so to finish that off, I would just get a flat block with some 60 grit on it, like that. And then... Now, I'm not gonna do that because I'm gonna go to the next stage. So that's stage one, folks, complete. Um, I will cover sanding in in a in an upcoming stream so yeah if you want to see how we do that i've got lots of tricks and tips for that um, it's coming in an upcoming stream but right now i'm going to go and do stage three and turn this into a full-on carve so i'm going to clamp it back up in position one and carol's got a question uh uh rock and roll says um any uh 
Is there anything that can be done to reduce the body weight? Um, well, if it had a cap on it, then what you could do is hollow the body out first before you stick the cap on. And then if you're feeling really fancy, you could put an F-hole in it. That's what we would call a thin line, like a thin line, I guess, um, thin line telecasters were the first ones I saw that were made like that. Um, you can hollow out the body and then stick a cap on the top. So we could have chose a different piece of wood for that. But with a guitar like this, it's a solid one piece body. There isn't a great deal we can do, really, bar hollow it out as much as possible. So that's what I'll do with my um, control cavities and, uh, and pickup routes and everything. I'll take out as much as I can. Um, and also there's, there is a, something very important about these controls. Now, this is stage one carving. So the top's actually still quite flat. But we could fit these pots in and they would all be the same depth. But by the time I've finished this, it's going to be rounded and we'll need to fit these pots individually. Um, if you're not sure what I mean, um, a pot is a potentiometer, like a volume, a tone or, or even a switch it could be. It needs to stick through the hole far enough to put your nut and washer on so that we can wire up the guitar and assemble it. Um, now with a carved top, that's complicated because we have to fit them all individually. Because of the curve, they'll all be at slightly different depths. So that's for another video. I'm not going to cover that today, um, but I will cover it for you probably on this very guitar actually. I might show you fitting the pots. But my point is what I want to get across now is that um, if you do any more carving than this, then you're probably going to have to fit your pots individually. And that is another operation and you've added um, more stages to your construction, which is obviously going to add your time and take longer and maybe be a little bit more difficult. So bear that in mind. Um, you're going to have to fit your pots individually if you do a full carve on your top. Right, another quick thing. Um, Grey Heart says, do you feel that making them with hand tools gives them a little extra thing that makes them special? Not really, to be honest. <laughs> Um, I've always had this theory that um, if Stradivarius had a router, he would have used it. I could be wrong, but nobody can prove me wrong, can they? Because he's dead. <laughs> but there are die-hard guitar makers out there who only ever use hand tools, chisels and planes and that kind of thing. Um, personally, I'll use whatever I think will get the job done um, best. First is, is the result. Second is, the, is the, um, the speed it takes to do it. More often than not, I will use a machine and then follow it up with a hand method. So I end up doing both. But um, I'm going to start carving now, Carol. So let me get going and cast some more questions in a minute. What can I show you what I for? Whatever looks best. Absolutely beautiful. So what I'm doing is carving now. It's a bit blurry. I'm carving from the apex down and then I'm going to go from the apex down this way and what I'm trying to do is create a little flat spot all the way around this is what they call the recurve and it actually comes from arch top guitars um, violins that kind of instrument it comes from acoustic instruments where this is an important part of the, the building operation where you're dialing in the tone. You're actually weakening. If this was an acoustic guitar, what I'm doing right now would be weakening the top to allow it to move more, to bring out the, the, the tone and the volume of the instrument. Um, on electric guitar, the only reason to do this is purely aesthetics. I'm trying to reach around the camera here. So we always carve away from, away from the tip. So this way like this, this way like this. And I'm trying to create a little flat spot. And you'll notice that I start on this tip and I go all the way around, finish on this tip, but we don't do inside the horns. We don't do inside the horns there and there. Let me just show you that from another angle. So these horns here, 
No, Cole. No. Here and here is finished. We don't touch that again. And now you can see this little flat spot forming. See, it already looks kind of like a carved top, doesn't it? But I'm just going to tidy that up and carry on round. Um, there's a couple of little things I need to show you as we go round, okay? So here is an external curve, easy peasy, and down into this internal curve, this is a little bit more tricky in here. So let me show you that. So the trick with the chisel is, oh, this is a gouge, by the way, that I'm using. Um, I think it's probably the best tool for the job. Um, expensive. I think this costs me about £27. Like, um, so they're not cheap, but still a lot cheaper than like a power tool would be to do this kind of work. So um, the thing with the gouge is if I try and force it, I'm liable to rip out a great big chunk of wood. So we do not force it with a gouge. We take small cuts and if it gets stuck, we take a smaller cut. I'm just trying to work my way around putting a flat spot in away from these apexes so from here down towards this internal corner now so I've already got my depth set because of my line and my first carve so I don't really want to go any deeper I'm just going down to the line I'm trying to make it go in straight, parallel to the floor or the bench. A little step all the way around. What it'll do is it'll create this nice little recurve shape. But I'm going to end up with a nasty bump here. We'll deal with that later. Step by step operation. So let's get down into this internal curve now and I'll show you how we deal with that. So we basically take small cuts, it's a bit difficult reaching around the camera but hopefully it's worth it so you can see in there what's happening. Luthier's eye view, eh? You already had hair cam. Have you? Did the hair? <laughs> oh, that was terrifying. Right, I'm going to go from side to side now and to make this messy bit as small as possible. And I'm always left with a little bit in the middle. So, side to side. One little trick is to rotate the gouge, that can help. Yeah, I'm afraid I can't make you one, Tony, because this is a one off. But if any of you have got a bit of wood in your shed that you want me to make a guitar out of, by all means. Um, what I do is I test it with a, a moisture meter. So here's another subject for another video, moisture meter, to, uh, to check that it's ready for working on. Um, you can't just chop a piece of wood out of your garden and use it for a guitar. It needs to be properly dried. Now that might entail just leaving it in a dry place for two years. Or if you want to do it faster, there's all kind of kilns and stuff you can make or buy. But what I would recommend is that you always buy your wood from a guitar maker supplier. Because then you know, at least you know it's going to be properly treated and taken care of. 
So you can see I'm left with this lump in the middle, it's getting smaller and smaller. There will come a point where I'm just going to now go straight in this way. Straight in at 90 degrees. Like this, just to finish it off. And there you go. So that's the first bit done. Now I just need to carry on round. I'm going to um, carry on round the back here, kind of the same way, and then I'll spin it round and do the other side the same. It looks like I'm going to get all the way round today, so I'm quite pleased about that. Um, I'm probably not going to get it sanded though, I want to save that for another stream. So let me just carry on, and if you've got any more questions, shout them out. Sorry, my dear. Notice that I am keeping both hands behind the blade at all times. And this flat spot, I haven't drawn it on. Um, I don't normally draw it on because I kind of do things by eye. But I'm, I'm basically putting a flat spot on and it gets wider. You'll notice it's shallow there. And then it's gonna get wider around the back. I don't normally draw it on, I just do it by eye. Because like I was saying earlier, um, there is no right or wrong. Do it until you like it. You can go as shallow or as deep as you like. So I'm halfway round now, almost. Um, when, I, when I do get all the way round, then I just do need to do a little bit blending in and then I can show you what it looks like. So. Um, if, you're, if you're wondering, it is great fun. <laughs> it's great fun. Great fun, this. So if you are gonna carve your top, then you're going to need an extra tool. Um, my chosen tool was this gouge, but there are other ones. I promised that I'd show you the, uh, the curved planes, so let's do that. Um, Ralph Kapp Kappmeyer says, which brands would you recommend for a chisel? Look, <laughs> look at that. Well, I don't really do recommendations, to be honest, but um, mine's a Marples. If you can find this one, it's a corker, something like that. That is a seven eighths inch gouge. Something like that is what you want. Any big gouge will do you. Um, he said, if, if not a brand, what to look out for? That's about, how do you spot a crap one? Um, I don't really know how you'd spot a crap one. Look for a name brand that you recognise would be the safest bet. Um, yeah. Mostly you'll find if you get an old chisel. I've got um, a couple of old ones. Uh, here's, here's just an old one that I found somewhere, picked up from somewhere. Car boot sales you can sometimes get them from. That's a nice little gouge. Um, wasn't super expensive, so you can pick them up. Anything will do, just something roughly gouge shaped. They are a real nightmare to sharpen. <laughs> You'll, yeah, you that was the next us? question. We'll do, a, we'll do a video on that, but that's a whole video, just sharpening these buggers. Um. Is it useful to have a few different size gouges? To be honest, I've got my seven inch, seven eighths of an inch gouge. That's twenty two mil gouge, seven eighths of an inch, I think, and that's the only one I use. Um, 
That is a small lie because I have got another gouge that I use. Um, I can't find it now. I've got a small gouge, which is like a quarter of an inch gouge, which I use for, I just use it for digging out the truss rod slot. When we put a veneer on the truss rod slot, we have to dig it out again. Um, I very rarely use anything other than this 7 8 chisel, to be honest. Right, quick, before you start again. Hi, uh, Green Mirror 555 says, Hi, I'm late to the show. Was this a mahogany body? And how do other woods chisel sculpts compare to this one here today? Um, is there an aged, older tree that's better or anything? So he's asking about the, is this mahogany? And how do other woods chisel compared to what we're showing here? Okay, well this wood has been chiselling very well <laughs> all around this side, but I know that this side is a lot harder. It's just the way the grain goes, the grain's closer together on this side. It it's a one-piece body and it's made from walnut. 400 year old! 400 year old walnut from Glastonbury, no less. So imbued with all the goodness. So we'll just take a step back and have a look. So this is stage one carve. Hopefully you can see a bit of shaping. And then stage two carve, full carve. We'll get you some better shots of that in a minute. But I'm just going to carry on and carve around this side. This side's going to take a bit longer. Um, so yes, your question is, this side was nice and easy, just like mahogany, but this side's going to be hard like ash because <laughs> it's got tighter grain. So you, you, that's what, one of the reasons you recommend a, a mahogany like wood to start, to start with, isn't it? Exactly, yes. Good point, Carol. I recommend your first build, use mahogany. Um, there's a reason why people like mahogany, apart from the fact that it sounds great, it's um, one of the easiest woods to work with. So, um, yeah, you, you can probably tell already, guys, this is a lot harder on this side. So, as I was saying, there are power tools that you can use for this. Somebody mentioned Festool earlier. Um, but they're expensive. And for a beginner, I would recommend um, that you can do it all just with a rasp. Some of this you can do with the, um, the little round rasp as well. It just feels a bit more like you're cheating. Feels a bit more Heath Robinson. But there's certainly no shame in that. Use whatever works, I say. So I'm going to try and just pick the pace up a little bit and get around here. I know some people use grinder wheel attachments. Again, it's a power tool though, so I'm not using that today. But this is a, a grinder. I use it mostly for metal work, but you can get a, um, an attachment that's similar to a rasp or a microplane, and then you can do your carving with that. But it's really noisy and dangerous. So we don't use them in here. What we do use though from time to time is something called a duplicarver. Um, I'm not going to show you that today either because we'll maybe save that for another video. But if, um, if you really get into this game and you want to make a lot of carved tops, then you're going to be needing a duplicarver, which is basically kind of like a large etch a uh, sketchograph machine that can copy 3D shapes. 
So you have your pattern on one side and it copies it into a piece of wood on the other side. Wow, look at this. So you have to be careful with a chisel because it can lift out great big chunks if you're not careful. But we are getting there. So people are talking on the in the feed about different chisels that they've tried. So if anybody's watching, yeah. Um, if you look at the comments, uh, the chat from today, the live chat from today, you'll see the, all the different names that are coming up. Great uh, stuff. For tools and chisels. Yeah, recommendations for your chisels in the comments. Thanks for that, folks. Yeah, this is what I was hoping was going to happen because I don't want to come on YouTube and just show off. I've got absolutely no interest in just coming on YouTube and showing off. But what I want to do is I want to show people that it's, it's not that difficult. Anybody can make guitars. And I think if you, if you play guitars, you should make your own. That's what I think. But then it's not everybody's cup of tea, not everybody wants to, and that's fine. There's a lot of people, they're just players, and they've got absolutely no interest in building. And I totally respect that. But for me personally, I think I like, well, I know I like building more than I like playing. So for me, This is where it's at. There's, I'm never happier than when I'm pushing a chisel through a piece of wood. For me, this is what it's all about. It's just me and the chisel now. And you guys. It's great to have you guys along for the ride. And this is exactly what I was hoping would happen. Like I was saying, I'm not here just to show off. Um, but what I was hoping was that, um, you know, all you lot will chip in all your knowledge and expertise as well. And we'll all learn something. Um, I'm always amazed that pretty much every time I run a course, and I've run hundreds now, um, you know, we run workshop courses as well, so, we do our online stuff, but for 20 years, people have been coming to my workshop all over the world. From all over the world. And I've been teaching them face to face how to build guitars. The online stuff's a lot more recent. So I'm going to come a little bit from side to side. From both directions. And then the final bit at 90 degrees like this. Yeah, so I was hoping that um, it would open up some discussions and if I don't know something, then if there's someone in the comments that does, that's absolutely fantastic. So that's what it's all about, the guitar making revolution. Sharing our knowledge instead of uh, keeping it all hidden like a lot of guitar makers do. They hate sharing their knowledge. I guess a lot of these little tips and tricks, the hard one, you know, you might struggle doing something for years and then suddenly find a way to make it like 10 times easier. Um, well, for me, I, I enjoy sharing and uh, that's what I do. So that is what our guitarmaking.co.uk site is all about and it's working and so that's all down to you guys um, as they said if you if you build it they will come and uh, here you are so thank you Carly um, in Australia Carly's in Australia uh, she's asking 
is a wood turning gouge okay to use? Wood turning gouges are different. Um, for one thing, if you look at the bevel on this one, um, oh, there's a word for this. It's a, I've forgotten, there's a name for it. Uh, it's an in canal, I think they call it. In canal. Um, somebody will correct me on that. Um, but this is, it's an internal bevel, you see. Um, your wood turning gouge might not be an internal bevel. And they're sharpened to different angles and that. But um, wood turning chills are not the same. So um, unless you're very lucky and you've got one exactly like that. I would suggest it's probably not the same, not usable for this. So it's an internal bevel look, not always easy to find. Um, I think there are wood turning chisels that look very similar to this. Um, but just make sure that you've got the bevel going the right way. The thing is a wood turner's chisel is they're made from the same stuff, so if it's the same shape, then it's perfectly usable. So, um, you might be able to, just final thing on that, you might be able to modify a wood turner's chisel. So Raoul, um, who's watching in New Zealand, he says he has some very nice uh, native NZ timber, it's over a thousand years old. Wow. It's too nice. You. Yes, I know what you mean. Is that Raoul? Yeah, in New Zealand. I know what you mean, Raoul. And Carly Al says, almost too nice to use. And Carly says it's it, she feels it might be quite scary to use something like that. You'd feel really responsible. Yeah, I totally understand that. Um, yeah, um, sometimes you just have to do it. Yeah, I, I've, I didn't want to, wasn't, wasn't playing top trumps, so I wasn't going to no, brag him. But, no, um, not bragging, just how that felt weird to um, you. Well, I've, I've worked on guitars that are worth many thousands of pounds, <laughs> many tens of thousands of pounds, and uh, you just have to treat them all the same. So... Um, yeah, there was a, if you look at my Preston Reed um, signature baritone guitar, that's probably the most single most expensive piece of wood that we've used. Um, but you just have to treat it just like any other piece of wood. As soon as you start thinking it's special, <laughs> as soon as you start treating it special, it'll turn around and do something to you. They're like children. You can't treat them special. Them. Otherwise they get spoiled, yeah. Um, Green Mirror 555 says, is it called the flute? Is what called the flute? The bit on the end of the... The flute, yes, I think... I think it is, yeah, I think the, there is... Yeah, I think that part of it is possibly called the flute. You're probably right, but I'm not an expert on chisels by any means. I just... Um, like with, well, that's one of the things I like about guitar making is that you get to do a little bit of a lot of things. So, you know, nowadays we're making our own chisels. Um, we do a bit of metal work, we do a bit of electronics, a bit of woodwork, finishing. There's all kinds of things that we do a little bit of, and that's what keeps it interesting for me. That's one of the reasons I like making guitars, because it's never dull. And like, I didn't expect to be using this to do that today, but it just happens to be the best tool for the job. There. Now, if we take a step back and look at it now, you can see, hopefully you can see, oh yes, baby. It looks a bit rough, but it's basically a carved top. It's got quite of a nasty step there, so we're just going to deal with that. Um, and then it's, it's pretty much done. I might just quickly give it a quick scrape 
um, and then we'll step back and have another look at it. So um, let me just do that. We'll give it a final scrape and then I'll tell you what's coming up on Wednesday. We've got some stuff coming up, so hang about for that. Um, Carly asked a question about moisture, but I can't find it. Um, so I'm guessing she's asking a question about moisture. Yeah, moisture. Um, Wood, uh, wood, wood for guitar making, it needs to be a little bit drier than your average wood for, say, furniture making. It needs to be a little bit more stable. So um, it needs to be fully dry. That's why we recommend you buy it from a proper guitar maker suppliers because it will be, um, it will be properly treated and dried enough for guitars. We take it a little bit further than we do normally for furniture. Um, exact figures I'm not going to give you because it varies for species. There's a species adjustment, which a lot of people don't realise. So they get a metre like this and, and they'll take a reading with it. Um, but you don't, they don't realise there's a species adjustment. So it might read 10% on there. Um, but for mahogany, that'll actually be different to, say, ebony. So you need, you need a, there's a table it gives you the moisture adjustment and it will say like ebony plus four mahogany plus eight or minus eight i can't remember the numbers off the top of my head i always look it up but um but the main thing for me is um check it's reasonably dry sort of like 10 to 12 percent is fine um but what i'll do is um i'll check it and then i'll check it two weeks later if it hasn't moved, then it's probably stabilised. I'll check it again another two weeks just to make sure. That's what I've been doing with this. And I was quite happy that the moisture content stopped changing and it hadn't changed for a while now. And so I was quite happy that it's stable. Um, so that's how I do it. We'll go into a lot more detail on that in another video. Um, but I'm just going to knock off this lump around the top now. We clamp it back up in the first position. Really, I've actually finished carving now and I'm just blending. It's half so yeah, that was a, a long one today. Um, while I'm just finishing up, um, I'm just going to knock off this top edge, right? So what I do is I just, I'm going to put another facet on as low as possible, but without hitting that edge. As soon as I hit that edge, I'm going to stop. <laughs> And while I'm just doing this last bit, um, I'll probably tell you about what's going on on Wednesday. So I'm trying to just increase the size of this facet here and get rid of this lump. Um, Something like that. Did you mention what the maximum moisture was? No. Um, I'm not going to get into all that moisture content stuff. Look at that, bit of a scrape. Yeah, sorry, I'm not going to get into all moisture content stuff because it's it depends on different wood. Um, and so we'll do a video on that, a separate video on that. Beautiful. It's going to be hard to stop. Knocking off the lump. Yeah, never mind. I'm sure it went somewhere and somebody usually where that when these things happen they clear out the loft eventually and it all goes somewhere. 
someone like me will buy it. We've done that several times where, um, you know, somebody's um, left a load of stuff behind and, uh, you know, it's nice to know that it's gone to a good home, isn't it? And it's being used. A little bit of rasping here, just to even it up. If I catch it there, I'm just going to stop. Yeah. Cheers, Bojack. Yep, cheers Bojack for that. We need all the encouragement we can get. Um, so what, what people are saying is that you make it look easy. Because um, some people have done it are saying it takes longer than this. But um, that's just your practice. Sharp tools. Practice. And the fact that I know that people are watching <laughs> certainly brings a puts a certain free song on it or whatever it is. But yeah, obviously I've done this before, guys, a lot of times. So it may well take you a lot longer than it took me. But don't worry about it. There's no rush. No, I, I was saying you, you don't know what time it is, do you? Yeah, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about even the world's best guitar maker, in my eyes, the world's best guitar maker, even he doesn't know how long it takes to make a guitar. <laughs> so. This is what me and Carol are always falling out about because <laughs> obviously the customer needs to know when he's getting his guitar. Yeah, sorry Ed. Sorry Ed. And um, it's not always an easy answer, so. See, when they were talking earlier about the, the old or the valuable wood, you've also got to be in the right, you've got to feel it, haven't you? It's, to do a well, before. personally, yes. Um, sometimes it can be a bit daunting. Um, but a lot of times it's, it's in your head, you know. Like I say, one piece of wood is wood's wood. Some pieces of wood are harder than others. But at the end of the day, they're just bits of wood. Um, but having said that, I do need sometimes to be in the right frame of mind to tackle certain jobs. What? Camera two, please, Carol. Two. Yeah, it's a better camera. Okay. That's showing the carved top. Um, you've got a carved top. Question. So there we go. From Clint. There's our top carved. Now it looks a bit rough, as you can see. I'm not. Um, I've not sanded it. So, um, and also you'll notice that the bit in the middle is flat. Yeah. That's still flat. About that. Yeah, but by the time it's sanded, promise you, you'll think it's round. <laughs> um, it's, it's actually easier to leave the, this, this section here. Just this section here stays flat. And that's where the bridge is and the pickups are. Um, you can, you know, you can take it to the extreme and you can make this bit round as well. But then you need to use um, arched pickups around. Uh, makes things a little bit more tricky. So. Most carve top guitars that you'll see that are kind of this style ah, are they're actually flat in the middle, although it doesn't look flat. Um, I bet it doesn't look flat to you now, does it? Even though it is. So, yeah, it's only a small carve, but it looks bigger than it is because of this recurve, you see. Um, 
So when it's sanded, um, if you come back, maybe we'll do it next Saturday, sanding. Um, we'll see. I'm not sure what I'm going to do. But um, when I sand it, you'll see that it looks, it will look totally round. Uh, so um, possibly on Saturday, I might sand this up for you. Um, so we've got a couple more questions to finish with, but um, I'm going to tell you on Wednesday coming up, we're going to do a follow up on what we did last Wednesday was making a side. There was a few things that we didn't get to. So, um, and also we've, we've had some news. Um, a guy's contacted me, um, Marty, who makes, um, he makes, a f he makes the, the side benders and a few other things as well. So we're going to, um, I'm going to show you a few of those things on Wednesday. And uh, we're also going to take the side out of the, the bending machine that I put in. Um, so you can see what it looks like when it's done. And um, maybe show you some other different sides. Because uh, we didn't get on to um, talking about curve lining and that kind of stuff. So we're going to do that on Wednesday coming up. Um, we're going to finish with a couple of questions. And then I think we're done. So final questions, Carol. Um, well, actually, what Clint, super clunk, Clint was asking, um, he says, Gibson carve top applies the same method, but more facets, is it he's saying. So how do you, what he's asking is about the Gibson style. Right, a Gibson style is a single cut. This is what I call a double cut, which means that it's, it's the same on both sides. Um, a Les Paul is a single cut. Um, there's a horn down here, but here's not a horn. So imagine that horn being missing. Let me just do that. See, it looks a bit less poorly if I do that. If I just chop this horn off, that's kind of less poorly or not. It is a slightly different shape. Um, it doesn't have this corn, this calf here. It just goes straight to the edge. But, but apart from that, pretty much, there's not that many differences. It's a single cut, so it's slightly different. It is a more severe carve, so it's more roundy here. But yeah, it's the same techniques. Um, we've done plenty of those style of carves using the same technique. It is a little bit more different because of the top horn being missing. But um, what I would suggest is that you look at as many pictures as you can. Try and get um, your head around the shape. Um, if you've got one that you can have in your workshop to try and copy, that helps as well. Um, but yeah, it, it's slightly different for a Les Paul. But same, same techniques, just a slightly different shape. It's slightly complicated because, or slightly less complicated, because it doesn't have this, um, what we call a cutaway here. This shape just carries on to the end. Um, and it hasn't got the top horn. So a little bit different, but not that much really. Okay, so we're done. Um, so thank you so much guys for watching till the end much appreciated if you found any of that interesting enjoyable or useful make sure to hit the um you're gonna get your rasp and rasp the like button and make sure you're subscribed um well i've got so many ideas for videos that there isn't enough time to do them all so um we're not running short of ideas yet but if there is anything in particular that you want me to cover, make sure you leave a comment and uh, we'll get to it. Um, so thanks for watching, guys. Um, tune in on Wednesday for um, making the sides, uh, what should we call it? An update on making the sides. Uh, and we'll see you then, one o'clock. And same time Saturday, we're here. Wednesdays and Saturdays. One o'clock. One o'clock's our time. So we'll see you then. Brilliant. Thank you very much, guys. Remember, check twice, cut once. See you next time.